So, uh, so let's just uh, jump right into this. I'm going to try and make this short uh, just so we can go through it very easily. So here is the basic principle of anterior dislocation, right? I mean, uh, most of you should be familiar with the fact that there's a glenoid and I want to take a pen and I like to scribble now. So there's a glenoid here, there's a humeral head here. And basically, once uh, this humeral head walks anteriorly, it takes off a bunch of this anterior capsule, labrum, sometimes bone, and all of this together. So this is what happens in anterior dislocation. And along with that, the posterior superior humeral head, because the humeral head tends to dislocate anteriorly and inferiorly, starts to, uh, starts to impact uh, posteriorly. And this gives you your Hill-Sachs lesion. And then anteriorly, you here you have your bank cart. So anteriorly, you have the bank cart. And uh, posterior superiorly, you have the hill sac. So remember, H is for hill sacs and H is for humerus. So the hill sacs is on the humerus. And as you will find out later, the humerus is pretty funny. So that sort of fits together. Now, whenever you have anterior dislocation, there are three, three structures that are involved. The anterior inferior glenoid, the posterior superior humeral head. So this is your, uh, your bank art lesion. This is your hill sacs lesion. And the third thing is your capsule. So these are the, the three structures that you need to remember. So now what happens with uh, on the glenoid side when there's an anterior dislocation? If you were to think of yourself locked in your bathroom or if you were locked outside your bathroom and somebody was inside and in these COVID times there was no other place to go, then you would want to kick the door open. And when you kick the door open, you can produce different kinds of damage based on where you kick the door open. So if you were to consider that this is a door um, this is the sort of the wall over here and you're looking from above. This is the door hinge um, and then this is the door over here. So when you kick the door open, you can either just open the door. You can open the door and you can break the hinge. You can peel the hinge off the side over here or you can take off the bone, which means take off a piece of the wall as well. And essentially, when you look at all the labral lesions that come with anterior dislocation, they are just variations of whether you just open the door whether you kicked the door open and took a piece of the hinge, whether you took the hinge along with some of the other part of the wall, or you just broke the whole garden wall, right? So you have all of these. And then the other thing is, because the door was locked on this side, sometimes you might break this lock, and in which case you start to get humeral sided lesions. So when we look at the MR appearances of all the anterior inferior glenoid lesions, you can have the most typical lesion, which is the bank art lesion, which means the labrum comes off, the periosteum comes off the bone and along with that, that periosteum breaks over here. So here you have the labrum off, the, the capsule torn and this periosteum broken here. And this is your typical soft tissue bank art lesion. If along with this labrum, a piece of bone also came off, then you would get what's called a bony bank art lesion. Now, the second thing is if you weren't quite as forceful, you know, say you didn't have a good breakfast or didn't go have a good lunch or you really didn't need to go that badly, but you just want to kick the door anyways, um, then you would get something where the, the periosteum strips off, but it doesn't actually break. So you can see that here, the periosteum, here is the glenoid, the anterior glenoid is here. Okay, and I've zoomed these images up. This here is the, is the, is the periosteum and then this black structure here is the labrum. And you can see this thing coming off with the periosteum here is continuous. And this continuous periosteum with the labrum coming off is something called a Perthes lesion. Okay, so this is what you will see um, at times. Um, a third variation to this would be the GLAD lesion. Now, the GLAD lesion is actually a lesion that is named by a sadist because anybody who has a GLAD lesion is not actually a happy lesion to have. It's not a great lesion to have because there's cartilage involved. And anytime there's cartilage involved in the orthopedic system, we're not very happy unless you're an orthopedic surgeon who does cartilage work, in which case you look at it as a way to buy a new Ferrari. But that's a whole different story altogether. So when you talk about a GLAD lesion, essentially what happens is that this labrum and the capsule have come off. But because this labrum is very closely associated with the articular cartilage down here, you see some breaking of the articular cartilage. So if we look at this area here, here you see the bone. Here you see this is the glenoid. You can see the labrum has come off here with the with the along you know, this entire thing is the labrum along with some of the bone over here. And you can see this little flaky stuff here. Does everybody see this? This flaky stuff here is essentially the cartilage that's coming off. So that is called a glenolabral articular disruption. And the only reason you're glad to have this is if you're an orthopedic surgeon who's going to repair it and buy himself a Ferrari. So that is the glad lesion. Now, the next lesion here is the Alpsa lesion. And in the Alpsa lesion, I want you to try and remember 
that situation where we kicked the door open and we broke off the hinge. But what if the hinge just came and it flipped on itself here? So the labrum comes out and it flips and it basically between this elevated periosteum, the labrum comes and places itself as a balled up structure. In other words, this cannot heal well. So in the old days, people were very, very interested in talking about two lesions. The Perthes lesion, because they said, if you don't break this periosteum, then this won't heal properly. So they used to say it's important to call a Perthes lesion because that means the periosteum is not broken. And until you break the periosteum, you can't get a good outcome. So that was the first thing. So they would say, oh, so you have to tell them that. So they go in and remember to break the periosteum. Now, most orthopedic surgeons can go in and see that for themselves now. So you don't have to get that crazy about it. And the second thing is an Alpsa lesion. So people who are managed conservatively for an Alpsa lesion, um, this is like a stenar lesion in the thumb because the labrum sort of comes and sits between the periosteum and the glenoid. And therefore, this labrum will never come back here and fix itself normally. Okay, so when you see that, when you see that this labrum is basically sandwiched between the periosteum and the glenoid, this may not come back and fix properly. And then that is called an Alpsa lesion or an anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion. And last but not least, you have a lesion where essentially instead of the glenoid side, which looks okay over here, you have a problem at the humeral side. So this is called a Hagel lesion where you have an, a rupture of the capsule on the humeral side. Okay. Uh, some people say the best way to see this is with an arthrogram. Some people say all these you can see better with an arthrogram. We are not arthrogram users in our practice. We have not found this to be a problem. I think with good high resolution MRI, you can see all of these things. And even people who talk about capsular and pericapsular leakage of contrast, um, they have found that there is pericapsular leakage of contrast even with an arthrogram, even with an intact uh, capsule. So, you know, you've got to be careful about that whole situation. So is everybody sort of clear on what the variety of lesions are along the anterior inferior glenoid? In other words, if you kick the door open, how does the door break open? Is it just the door opening? Is the door with the hinge flying off? Is the door with the hinge peeling off? Has the hinge folded back on itself? Has it taken out a piece of the wall? These are essentially the variations that you see. And if you think logically, this will come to you fairly naturally. Now, on the humeral side, on the other hand, uh, what you ended up having is these depressions. So you can have these flat sort of Hillsax lesions like this. You can have more hatchet shaped Hillsax lesions like this. So you can have a variety of shapes. So you have flattened Hillsax lesions and you have wedge shaped Hillsax lesions. So what happened in the beginning? They saw these soft tissue bank art lesions. They started fixing them uh, with arthroscopy and they said, oh, we're so clever. We've cured everybody and they're all feeling fine. But what happened was they started getting dislocations again and again and again. And then they started looking at this and they said, oh, my God, this is not happening. And they started to realize that along with that regular uh, dislocation that kept happening, essentially what happened is a part of this anterior glenoid bone got worn off. And when you see wearing out of that glenoid bone, essentially what happened is the articular surface of the glenoid became smaller. And therefore, it became much easier for this humeral head to slip out. So these people started having recurrent dislocations. And they said, this is a problem. This is a bony issue. And we're orthopedic surgeons. And how can we deal with bony issues being a problem? So what they decided to do was they decided to take a piece of the coracoid process. And along with that coracoid process, they would transfer it down here and attach it to the anterior inferior aspect of the glenoid and fill up that gap. And this was obviously by a French guy called Latarge. And now there are a lot of other modifications to this. And so this is often called congruent arc surgery. Now, this also is something to keep in mind that sometimes when you have shoulder dislocations, they go and collide against the coracoid and you can see a coracoid fracture. So when you're looking at a patient who's had a shoulder dislocation, don't forget to look at the coracoid because sometimes that may become important in the original eventual repair. And so you should mention if there's a injury or not. If there is a coracoid injury, it's not again the end of the world. They can always take a piece of iliac crest bone and put that in here to fix this area. But it just means they need to be aware of that beforehand. So you have this congruent arc surgery. Now we thought, OK, now we know how to deal with uh, dislocations. We're very good. We're very smart. We're very clever. And we're the greatest people in the world. Wonderful. But no. Uh, what they then discovered that, no, people are still having problems. And what they discovered at that point in time is they said, we've been looking at the glenoid all along, but we've forgotten about the Hillsax lesion. And that also has something to do with this problem. And what they discovered was that if you had a really big Hillsax lesion, 
then every time you rotated your arm out, this notch here would go and engage with this glenoid here and this whole thing would get stuck. And when you get stuck, it is called engaging. For married people, you know what that means. It's usually the beginning of the end. That's right. So when you have an engaging Hillsax lesion, that's a bad thing. Uh, and at that point in time, they have to start to think, should we do something about the humeral lesion as well? So what they decided to do with that was they decided to look at all these other fancy studies because they were, again, orthopedic surgeons with a lot of time to kill uh, because half the things they were doing weren't working well or whatever else. So they said, well, let's start studying this. So they started doing these modeling things and they started discovering that of the entire glenoid surface area, only 83% of it is used in the articular function. So they said, hmm. 83% of the glenoid surface area is there. So they said that if your hill sacs lesion, if the width of your hill sacs lesion is longer than 83% of the width of the glenoid, then this is going to engage. Okay, and then this is going to be a problem. And this means you'll have to do something on the humeral side as well. And what would they do on the humeral side? They would essentially look at this and they would put in a piece of the infraspinatus muscle in here and fill up that gap. Um, and then this is what they would do. And this would prevent the engagement from happening. And then ultimately the husband and wife would live happy lives because they'd be separate from each other. So this is sort of where we look at the um, hill Sachs lesion. So now what happens when we look at this entire complex, we realize that there is a glenoid component. We realize that there's a humeral component. And we need to try and understand as to how much we have compromised each of these bits and how these two bits will play with each other. So the first thing that we did was when we had a patient who has glenoid bone loss, we need to calculate the percentage of glenoid bone loss. And in order to do this, what we do is we draw what's called a best fit circle along the glenoid. So in other words, the posterior inferior quadrant of the glenoid is usually not affected. So we draw a circle that runs parallel to this and then we imagine the rest of the circle going all the way around. And we say that is the actual diameter of the glenoid. Okay. And let's just say that is A to B. Okay. And then we draw a point where the glenoid actually ends and let's call that point C. Okay. So when we look at this, we say AC is the amount of glenoid bone that's lost. Okay divided by AB, which is the entire expected length of the glenoid, correct, into 100, because we like 100, no, because we like to see things in percentages, will give you the percentage of bone loss. And if your bone loss exceeds 22 to 25%, then that is a problem. And then those are the situations where they need to do a Latarge procedure. On the other hand, now what you've discovered also is that the actual glenoid length is BC. Okay. And I don't mean BC in the way that most of you use BC very flippantly. Uh, I mean B CB as a distance. So this distance CB is the actual length of the glenoid that remains right now. And we know from that wonderful study that they did that 83% of CB not BC, okay, 83% of CB is articulating with the humeral head, all right? Now, we also know that this is the width of the humeral hill sacs defect, okay? And let's call this XY for whatever reason, okay? So if we know that XY is longer than 83% of CB, then we are dealing with something that is an engaging lesion. And if we are dealing with something that is an engaging lesion, then we know that engagements are the beginning of the end. And therefore, we need to start thinking about doing something about the hill sacs side of things as well. So where does that leave us? When we have a patient with anterior shoulder instability, we have got different situations. We've got A, an issue where we have a soft tissue bankart lesion. And this is usually treated with an arthroscopic repair. So this is all your soft tissue bank art, your um, Alpsa, your GLAD, your, um, you know, your uh, um, 
whatever all those little labral tears you can deal with with this once you go into somebody having a big hill sacks lesion that means there's a big defect on the humerus but there's not a lot of loss on the glenoid side then they would do something called a ramplissage right which is where they take that infraspinatus muscle and fill that gap up the third situation is where you don't have much of a hill sacks lesion but you have a big bank art lesion in other words this soft tissue bank art has actually gone on for long and we actually have bone loss so you measure that bone loss and you say we've got you know we've got more than 20% bone loss in which case somebody needs to have a latage procedure or they take that little bit of coracoid and jam it in there and fix it and on the other hand you have the last situation where you have somebody who's got an engaging lesion or you have large hill sacks and a uh, uh, bank art lesions with lot of bone loss in which case you may need to do both a remplissage as well as a latage so for anterior instability you have to remember that it is the interplay between the glenoid the humeral head and the capsule the soft tissue glenoid lesions typically will be managed arthroscopically and you can enjoy then dwelling for hours on deciding whether something is a perthes or a hemi perthes or a perthes mother in law or, you know or an alpsa with a third cousin related to you know whatever that you can spend all the time you want doing but it's a waste of time the key thing over there is is it just a labral lesion or does it have a bony involvement with it and if the bony involvement is on the humeral side only or if it's both the humerus and the glenoid so today the interest is now on determining whether people are engaged or not engaged and if they're engaged then obviously doom is on the way and if they're not engaged then probably things are better for them so this should sort of give you a clear understanding of anterior instability what you really need to know